This is not the year of COVID 2.0. This is not the year of pandemic. This is not the year of political unrest. This is not the year of racial tension. This is not the year of division in the church. This is the year of Jesus, just Jesus. Jesus, this is your year. This is your moment. This is your hour. This is your history. This is your platform. This is your stage. This is your church. This is your pulpit. This is your conference. This is the year of Jesus. Jesus, we are your people. We are your church. We are the wild ones. We are the peculiar ones. We are the called out ones. We are the anointed ones, the healed ones, and the set free ones. This is the year of Jesus. Not fear, not doubt, not anxiety, just Jesus. Not strife, not division, not confusion, just Jesus. Not hate, not death, not religion, just Jesus. Just Jesus. This is the year of Jesus. Victory Christian Center invites you to the Year of Jesus Conference 2021. Come experience every victory in Jesus. It's going to be three days packed full of worshiping, experiencing, and loving Jesus. You do not want to miss dynamic guest speakers, John Bosman and Reverend Samuel Rodriguez, Pastor Casey Doss, and incredible worship led by Catherine Mullins. We are gathering together to make Jesus famous, and you are invited to come experience Jesus this summer. Whether you are seeking, new to the faith, or have followed Jesus for years, this conference is for you. Invite your friends and join us for the Year of Jesus Conference. That is going to be a monumental conference. Say monumental with me. What incredible people that are going to be sharing with us. And we have just come up, our, our, a, our pastoral care uh, leadership came together this week and we made a decision on Saturday morning we are going to have a prophetic time. Our prophetic people that are able to come on Saturday morning are to be there with all the A campuses. A great opportunity if you're seeking the face of the Lord, maybe God's laying something on your heart. That prophetic team could minister to you that day. And who knows what life-giving words might be spoken over you that morning personally into your life. So be a part of this. It's going to be a great time. Say, it's going to be great. You can do better than that. It's going to be great. God is so good. It's so good to have again you all here. One of the people that I love actually next to Jesus is no one I love more than this woman. And uh, I know that God's laid a, a word on her heart. Uh, by the way, I just want, Shannon, I know you did something new today with the giving, and, and maybe while, before she preaches, you could put that on there. But we now have a QR code that actually goes on the screen. For those of you that are watching online, we're trying to make our, our streaming even a lot more friendly to you. So if you'd like to, to look at that, that, that code is on there, and it's another way for you to give besides text to give and online and what we do in-house. But uh, let's just pray over Mickey. I know that uh, her voice is still recovering from Africa. By the way, Lauren and Mikael and Elon and the SOS Kids team is on the grounds in Africa. This week they're prepping and getting things ready to actually start to minister uh, more fully on August 1st, but it's going to be great. By the way, are you guys hungry for a little pork? Next week at this time, you're going to be smelling the pork outside. And it will be, again, what an opportunity to, again, bring a friend. Don't forget to bring somebody if you want to bring them along. Great opportunity just to be able to talk to people and love on people. And, and we're excited about our neighbors that are coming. So, Father, today, thank you for the word that you placed in Mickey's heart. Lord, help her throat, her voice be strong and clear, no pain. And we thank you, God, for our hearts being receptive. In fact, church family, just open your hands out like this and say, Jesus, just say it with me. Say, Jesus, I'm open today for what you have for me, for this church family. May a heart be receptive, my mind open. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Whew. Wow. You know, sometimes uh, when you get to this place, you've just um, thought about things so much and you just 
Um, I'm at a place where I really don't even care if I get to share. I, I just want to spend time with him. And, you know, I say, Mickey, that's a shame because the weeks, of course, that I'm preaching, I press in a little bit harder and I'm listening a little bit harder. And I said, Lord, could you trust me with a word for your people? Could you trust this vessel that's seemingly pretty broken and just pretty fleshy at times and still is diving into things that I have no business doing? Could you trust me to bring a word to your people? And I think I have a little trinket for you today, and that's totally up to the perception of you. I know that um, we have, whenever I... (laughs) <laughs> Whenever it's time to preach again, I say, you know, what can we possibly preach that hasn't been already taught? I mean, we have done this for many, 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 many years. And I'm reminded that sometimes we don't remember. Is that true? Sometimes we forget some things. So in that moments of in those moments of forgetting, I was it came to my mind, and it just, it was so funny. I was just thinking about this the other day, and then I caught um, Bill Johnson's podcast, and he said this exact same things. Honestly, this is just so weird. But when we were coming, he didn't talk about my trip back from um, Odin, Illinois, with Becky and some things. Um, but one of the things that we brought back was something really huge on the back of a, of a cart, um, it was a jacuzzi. If she hasn't invited you yet, it's not quite ready. But anyways, there was this huge jacuzzi on the back. Becky, are you here? Yeah, you're here, right? I think I saw her. I don't think. Yeah, there she is. So on, on this, this big jacuzzi. So before we left, Randy, of course, is getting us all ready. He's not coming back on this trip. We have a U-Haul of everything that she has made her decisions. This is what I'm settling with. This is going away. This is do what this is thrown, whatever. So these are the <clears throat> last items for this final move for her to Pennsylvania. And we are all thrilled that she is totally settled and this is it. She's not looking back anymore for a piece of something. But anyways. So <clears throat> He's strapping down, and he says, you're going to need a few more straps. Well, he's a trucker. There's never enough straps. There's never. And it gives him an opportunity to use straps. And I thought <clears throat> straps were straps. Oh, no. He brings straps that were this wide. And he weaves them through with his expertise and, and all that he does You know, every day when he was, uh, this is when he had his own truck. Now he drives for a refrigeration truck, and he doesn't have to do that. We're very glad about that. But there were years and years that he did this. And from what I understand, when you strap down a load, after you travel a while, you do something else with that load. What do you think you do? Yeah, you're going to what? Tighten your straps down. Now, we're hauling this... I'm not. Becky, she's driving the big the big rig just like her husband. I'm following and making sure that if it drops on the road, I swoop it up. <laughs> so I'm following to see what the shifting and the moving is on things. And I'm watching. But when we stop, I remember going up to this jacuzzi and, and just kind of flicking those straps one more time. It just didn't seem like something I wanted to leave on the side of the road for the person <laughs> behind me, you know. And Well, I guess I was the person behind her, so I wanted to make sure the straps were good and tight. You know, and that, that little analogy right there, we actually went through this ourselves. We went on vacation once, and because you take too many things, I don't know, it seems silly that you take your entire life with you, the things that you cannot live without, and then you put them in the car and you go on vacation and look at all the same things that you couldn't live without. Very funny to me, especially with little ones. So we have all of these things, and Rob's like, well, it's not going to fit in the back, so where did we need to go? We needed to go high. So he and Luke strap on these big duffels onto the top, and we are looking like, you know, family vacation, you know, and, and it's, all, it's all good, and we strap those on. And Honey, I don't know how far down the road we got. Do you remember? Pretty, we got pretty far. 
it was a great strapping job until all of a sudden, shoom, did you not? So All right, so from my husband's account, he says that our son strapped those bags and wanted, you know what? And this was a big moment. This was maybe one of those crossing over moments of manhood. All right, buddy, you strap him down and get him down good. And I do remember this. So when those ball, those, those, those bags came flying off onto the highway behind us, like torpedoes. We were very glad they were soft luggage. There was no one behind us. And we pulled over and did the run, did the grab. Dad got involved, and we restrapped. Something that if indeed we had gone long enough, we probably should have checked the straps. Now, why? Why? What a silly illustration, I think that oftentimes we hear some fabulous, I'm going to just say that, fabulous words from God. I feel like we have been well fed in this house. Just say yes, even if you don't mean it. Okay. All right. So I believe that we, we sit here pretty, pretty well fed. And in that, we go out of here sometimes, and some, some of the things that people have said to, to us as being uh, as part of the teaching team, me being part of the teaching team, I'm like, wow, things like that, that's changing my life, or I'm grabbing on to that. That is, and, you know, those things, and you're like, let's give God, let's go back to God and everything. And I, I myself have done all those things as I have felt so challenged and I've looked at things and I said, this, I will never be the same again. But sometimes my straps got a little loose. And I forgot what I thought was such a rhema word from God for my life. And after a while, my luggage is sitting on the highway. And I have to reapply. Does this make any sense to you? So I, I feel that, and I have shared this before. The church that I went to in Philadelphia was surprisingly called Living Word Church, not Living Word Fellowship. It was a Living Word Fellowship and a church. And they only preached 12 sermons a year. Well, they preached 50 times. 50 time, 52 times a year, but they preach 12 topics, one for every month. And they inundated and saturated the whole body with one theme per month. Why would they do such a crazy thing? To help maintain some, some things. You know, it's, it's in, and I've said this before, being a kindergarten teacher, I remember by the third day after teaching the ABCs, I said, okay, they got it. We're done. Move on. Every day, every hour, sometimes three times an hour. What was that, kids? You know, as you come back again. So this is exactly what I'm saying. There has been a lot of things that have come out of here and that bear repeating. And I am... Um, I talked a lot about neurosensory. Does anyone remember that? Your neurosensories and how that works in your brain. And I feel like that has been such a strong word for me personally. I'm hoping that it made an impression on you that the paths that you beat down are the paths that will become part of your life. Am I correct in that? The things that you repeat over and over again, you will look to repeat those in your moment when you're not even thinking. If you're accustomed to getting up 5 o'clock every day and all of a sudden you do not need to do that, something about those eyeballs do this at 5 o'clock in the morning. If you're accustomed to meeting with the Lord every day, then when a day comes and you, haven't made any, you don't have any particular plans, but you just know, and you would miss it when something else takes that place. 
So that whole thing of building those neurosense waves, and I, I'm all about behavior, and I'm not about behavior modification. I'm not about you willing yourself into things. Because I think that's a sham. I don't think it la I know it doesn't last, and I know it's just something that you're willing. I'm not going to do that ever again. You need to be careful with statements like that. If it's ingrained deep enough within you, if this is a path that you have beaten down, it's going to take some time to machete out something else and to start moving in another direction. And then not only do you need to do that, but you have these stubs that you've got to walk through. You might get some bloody feet. And there's some things that are going to happen along the way that you just like, this is really hard. And now you still you want to go on that easy bet beaten path. That's exactly how our brains work. God is smart. And he knows that. And when he says things like, meditate on the word of God once a week. Once a day. All the time, continuously, to meditate on the word of God. Let it be something that is within my heart, something that I'm thinking about. Because if I'm thinking about it and I'm moving with it and it's something that's forever in front of me, then when my time of testing comes, I can't run from what's it right in front of my eyes. So those neural pathways, the, God, the beautiful way that God has created us. And I have actually written a little something for today, too. You know, um, what I put down as my title today is called War. Because <laughs> I know, and anyone who's been a Christian long enough knows that we're in a war. We are in a war. And I have heard some beautiful sermons um, on the garden. And my husband is referring a lot to a garden, which, honestly, I found that quite entertaining. I'm getting there, sweetheart. It's coming around. But you see, there was an opportunity that came that made the garden fun. And that opportunity was an app that could be put on your phone that can water your garden in any place in the world. It's an app that also checks your soil and lets you know. It knows when it rains and lets you know. And it, it, it responds to this by saying, would you like to water the garden today? Now, that, that spoke to that gardener right there. So I was gifted this technology. Here is the funny part about this technology. I really haven't been able to use it at all because as soon as I got it, it started raining every other day, buckets and buckets and buckets, and I'm waiting for the dry soil to show up so that somebody tells me I need to water my garden so I can push a button. I'm kind of excited about that. But every day he's looking at that garden and he does those things. And I said, I was laughing because when I came back from the kids' retreat last week, um, I haven't really, we haven't really visited the uh, picking and, and pulling the fruit out of the garden. We haven't really worked on that concept yet. So when you're in zucchini season and you don't have the concept of pulling zucchinis out of the garden, then you find yourself with these things that you're ready to build a boat and the canoe is coming, and like I'm just going, oh, look at you, and I'm just so amazed at 10, 12 inches overnight, and if you think I'm exaggerating, you're not a, you're not a gardener, because it's amazing, and I said, I brought in like two buckets of these huge big things, I found a couple that were a little smaller, I gave them to Jay, I said, it's the smallest thing I got, but he was able to do battle with them if he so desired, <laughs> So here we are at the garden, and I so appreciate having a helpmate to help that out. We need to tighten up our load. 
we need to see what's gotten loose. We start our journeys. You get to that place where you say, you know what, I have this, and you tighten that down. But life starts to jostle you. The road gets a little long. Miles start to take over. And if you don't revisit that, then you find yourself in a place with some loose straps and maybe not remembering the stories and the, 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 the rhema truth that God has given you. I want to go right into a verse one verse from a very, 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 very familiar proverb, which is Matthew 13, 22. Proverb, what did I say? Adverb. I'm teaching school. What, or what, <laughs> I don't know what I said. Proverb. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth Choke the word, making it unfruitful. Now, for those of you, I'm not going to read all of that proverb, but this is a, this is a beautiful illustration of three different kinds of soils and the hard and the, the, that's the so busy and the soft and, and all that God is talking about and how that seed, because the seed and the sower, the seed is the word of God. Online, it's Matthew. It's Matthew 13. Okay, it's Matthew 13, 22. I'm sorry. The seed falling among the thorns. Oh, my goodness. All right. And the condition of your heart, of course, is the soil. Oh, my. The productivity of the fruitfulness of a word that God spoke. You know, when God speaks a word, we say, oh, my gosh, that was such a fantastic word. But then it's got to land on some soil. What did I say? The word is, the seed is the word, right? The word now needs to land on some soil. So we know that whatever soil that lands on does not necessarily validate the trueness of that word. Is that true? Ooh. Because one person is going to receive that word. Another person is going to deflect it off with hardness. Another person is going to have all kinds of weeds and thorns in the way, just like I read in Matthew 13, 22. The seed fell on amongst the thorns. And Rob has talked quite a bit about thorns and weeds and the things that compete. And we know that these things really do compete with the seed that I put in the ground. So disturbing, you know, when you come back after a couple of days and it feels like you just weren't even there. It's something that needs tended so often to pull that because it's, it's looking, what are those seeds looking for? It's looking for the same things, the weed seeds are looking for the same things that my fruit seeds are looking for. It's looking for sunshine. It's looking for moisture. It's looking for good soil. So there's a war. There's a war that goes on. It goes on in that garden, and it goes on in our hearts. We have competition so often. And this is what I would like to revisit and to tighten down today. We have so much competition in our lives looking for all of the goodness other than just the seed that we plant of the word of God. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But keep in mind, it doesn't say faith comes by hearing the word of God. If faith came by hearing the word of God, we could just put that on while we sleep and we'd wake up with such great faith. We could just let that pour into our lives 24 hours and just wake up with amazing faith. Our connection is to the voice of God. Our connection, his voice is activated by our exposure to his word. The word enhances and trains us for hearing I have a word, God spoken, but I have, God gives me something, and I feel so enlightened by it. But then, oh, it comes amongst 
something that I have a complaint about or I don't understand or I'm disappointed. All of these are the other seeds that are coming in while that word is coming in. As you all know, busyness is a, is a big deal with me. And I, and I don't, I, I, I pray that I'm getting less busy with things that are just busy. There are things that have to be done, and I'm, I'm trying to get them in shape and hand them off. <laughs> so I want, I want to just hand things off to people and say, this is your time. Can you take care of those things? But that busyness increases our cares, doesn't it? These are seeds that compete with the word of God. They become those thorns and those, those, those weeds that are standing in the way. In my, my intellect, we say sometimes, well, you know what? I, I'm just, I look at this very, very mindfully, and I just can't believe by faith. You know, I think that's really an odd statement when someone says, no, I'm intellectual, and so I don't believe the Bible. And I'm thinking, God is probably one of the smartest people. In fact, I think he is. The smartest people I know. So I don't quite get that one. I fill my garden with all these wrong thoughts. And we understand because we believe. It's not we believe because we understand. We understand because we believe. Not believe because we understand. See, our belief propels us into understanding. And when we don't believe, we need to figure out what's in our garden. What is growing that is stopping that process? Faith doesn't deny, of course, that problems exist. Just their influence and what it means. So your plant has these competition and the water systems and we water, I know that when Rob waters the garden and when I get to push my button, it doesn't just water my plants. It waters my weeds. Did you ever notice that? I'm waiting for that big shark tank in discovery that says this will only support your tomato and green bean plants and eggplant. This will not water those weeds. I'll be the first one in line. Mm. God's presence waters all the seeds. Here's a perfect example, and I, this came specific, specifically from Bill Johnson, and he said that the example is at the Last Supper, John put his head on the chest of Jesus. Peter said, I will never deny you. And Judas walked out to betray him. That water of Jesus hit all three of those men with very different results. All seeds are watered in the presence. When we have wisdom, something comes to mind, and, and um, anger, arrogance, a seed that wants to be planted, quick to, quick to repentance. So when something comes to my mind and it's not something that I want in my garden, that is something that I need to very quick. I believe God gives us a moment. He gives us a moment where it doesn't take root. When something comes to you that's ungodly and with you being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you and he is your teacher and he is the quicker to your spirit. And so when that comes, you have but a moment. You have the choice. The choice. I will entertain and plant or I will get this out of here right now. That's your moment. That's the beauty of what Christ has done for us. <laughs> I love that about him. Quick for repentance so that we can say, no, no, I thoroughly want this gone. I'm not going to entertain this. And instead of judgment, I will pray for that person 
right now. Boy, was I hit with this this week. I felt like just at least, at least a dozen times I felt that come upon me. I would say half the time I was successful in working out. The other time I played with it because I was right. And it was important to me that I stay that way. But I gained nothing from that. And I put something else in my garden that doesn't belong. And then sometimes you pollute other people's gardens because you share it with them. And then you, you kind of spit a weed into their garden as well. So for that, before I preached today, I had my moment of repentance. I said, God, please, work with this vessel. <laughs> work with me. I see it. I see it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. The, sometimes we, we look at this being a faith issue, and I understand that, that we just need to have more faith, bigger faith, greater faith. Faith, huge faith. What does God say about faith? He says it's the size of a, a mustard seed. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you would have a hard time seeing it in the palm of your hand. You would have a very hard time. So if God is saying it needs to be the concept of faith is the size of a mustard seed. And with that kind of faith, that faith will move what? Mountains. So something so tiny that I can barely see, that much faith can move mountains, then I'm being sent a message here. The message that I conclude would be, is that I must have a lot of other things that I've invited in my garden because my seed is getting choked out by a lot of different things. My seed is being challenged because it's being overgrown by other things that I don't want in my gardens. But if indeed this small seed is big enough. So when we say all I need is more faith, is that true? Well, according to what I just spoke to you, it's not true. You don't need more faith. You need concentrated seed faith that mustard seed, you need to start weeding maybe some of the other things out, some of the other busy, some of the other yeses, some of the others not, that, that's not for me, so that your seed becomes strong in the ground and there's no competition around it. There's nothing around it that's going to challenge it in its growth. Does this make sense to you at all? So in light of that, mm, our faith can become diluted. And you all know what that is. You know, we have these concentrated drinks that we're always pulling out of this kitchen. That lemonade mix and that iced tea mix, and it says put in those three gallons, put, you know, two and a half cups of concentrate in there, and you're going to have something that tastes pretty good. But I'm kind of cheap, so I think I'll put my three gallons of water in there and use a tablespoon of iced tea mix. Just because I want it to last a long time. See, it's not how it works not how it works. We can't invite all these other things to come. In Mark 9, 17, this is Mark 9, 17, you see there where there is an example. This is where the demonic 
son comes. And it says, and I will read for you, and one person from the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son because he has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever he sees it, and whenever it seizes him, he slams him to the ground, foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes stiff. I told your disciples so that they would cast it out, but they could not do it. And he answered them and said, Oh, unbelieving generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy. And when he saw him, the spirit immediately threw him into convulsions, and he lied there, foaming at the mouth like a dead man. <clears throat> and the father reported, he will throw himself into the fire. He's thrown himself into the water to try to kill this thing. And Jesus said, and the father said, but if you can, can you imagine looking at Jesus and saying, if you can? If you can, if you can, wow. Jesus grabbed right onto that, and Jesus said, if you can, if I can, all things are possible for the one who believes. All things. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, well, he caught on to the message that was sent him as he sang, as he, he yelled, I do believe Help my unbelief. And Jesus saw that, saw that a crowd was coming, so he quickly rebuked the spirit. And after crying out, the boy was then healed. And, you know, I look at that example and I think, hmm, two different opinions. What was the father's opinion of what the problem was? He had a son that had a demon. So the problem is, is that I need this demon to come out of my son. What did Jesus see as the problem here? Unbelief. He didn't see the problem as being the demon. He saw the problem as being the unbelief. That should challenge us. Because we see what's right before us. We see what's right before us. So sometimes we operate in power, but oftentimes we need to operate in authority. Because the disciples then said, you know, we tried. What? Why didn't it work? And this is where Jesus said, some need to come through what? Prayer and fasting. Although I've pointed out in a previous sermon, Jesus was neither, neither did he fast. He didn't fast on a regular basis, <clears throat> but he fasted as a lifestyle, as a lifestyle. So he fasted for those 40 days coming into his ministry, but he fasted as a lifestyle. And when, when this came out, it was something that his authority was able to go right to that place. And that demon responded to that authority. So oftentimes we will pray for healings and we will, maybe something won't happen. And then we might have all kinds of excuses in our head why this might not happen. And we are creatures of rationale. Boy, are we there. So we try to think of many, 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 many reasons of why. And I get that. I'm right here. I'm right here with you. And when you see the disciples, I don't know that they actually just said, well, why did it not happen? They went right to Jesus and they said, why didn't it happen? Why were we not able to do this? You see, their expectation level was pretty high. And so when it didn't happen, they just assumed that it should happen. And when it didn't happen, they said, God, show us something else. Show us why. 
So they didn't rationale through that. They just went right to Jesus, and Jesus was unmoved. And he said, sometimes we have to step it up to a different level. And yet, he didn't fast on a regular basis, but he did fast when he needed to. Mm. See, what happens when our measure of faith is challenged by all that's around us? But because there are other things that are planted, we find this choking that happens. Prayer and fasting does not cast away the demons. Fasting sometimes becomes a hunger strike of not eating Thank you, until something happens. I don't know if you know that. I've tried that. You guys ever tried that? You want something really bad? Oh, come on. Tell me I'm not the only one. And I said, you know, I'm just not going to eat again. Now, I didn't know that I was doing this. I mean, now I look back on it and said, okay, I was just hunger striking. Um, so I just said, I'm not going to eat again until this happens. Right? Or at least until I get hungry. I believe fasting is when we become hungrier, hungrier, <laughs> when we become more hungry for something we can't see more than what we can see. Faith is unseen. Do you agree with me? Faith is unseen. Unbelief is what we can see. But faith is unseen. Jesus gave those disciples everything that he had. Everything. They had the authority. Too many things possibly were in their garden. Maybe there's things that they needed to examine and to see that if they had faith like a mustard seed, you see, that seed is only as strong as it can stand on itself. But plant it with your weeds. Plant all kinds of things that don't belong. And that mustard seed loses its strength. Fasting is learning to have an appetite for things you can't see. Eternal, eternal is what you can't see. So we have to understand that we're looking for the eternity. We can't see that. When we get a word or something, it comes and we see. Those are not necessarily things that we can see, but we're calling them out. A prophetic word is often calling something out that you can't see. See, it's faith. You're believing in something. You're believing in what God has pushed through you through that moment. And then you watch him do. Our Lord's Prayer. Say a little bit of this with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Kingdom of God come, yes. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. First prayer that those disciples said, would you teach us to pray? Would you teach us? And he said, Let's honor God. Let's hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. I'm so excited about this. We're getting ready to enter a whole series of the kingdom. Actually, they're starting it today in Victory Kids of the Lord's Prayer. I just love, I just love how God very strategically laid this out. And the, all his authority is in this prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. way to deal with unbelief is to put your attention on what's eternal, on what's eternal. The problem isn't the demon, but rather your unbelief in what to do. Learn to pray by being willing to skip maybe a meal or two just to draw your attention into something other than your stomach. I would say for me personally, it's really not eating until I don't want to eat anymore and I can't see anything other than him. That's how my fast 
gently work because the first day I am flesh hungry. Second day, still feeling it, but something's starting to ease up after, you know, the second day, still feeling it, but there's something by, by the third day, I'm starting to lose my appetite. Something is starting to happen. That's the physical part, but my my prayer life starts to shift, and I can feel that shifting because I am not distracted. It's, it's almost like I've started to weed out, and now I'm starting to be the single seed that's starting to grow and to flourish in this garden. And we've killed some of that flesh stuff out of there. And I believe all fasting today, I'll just go ahead and say it, should be done with media fast as well. Because we are every bit as entertained through the media and computers, television, all of those particulars as we are with our food. So just to replace one for the other. We don't replace one addiction for the other. We just say, God, let's clean this up. Let's get, let's get. Let's get some attention here where it needs to be. This is not a sermon on fasting. That's an absolute freebie there. Mm. We give many excuses why things don't happen. We have some pretty bad theology. I know that I do. And I, I try to rationalize why and so forth and so on. And, but we say God just works in mysterious ways. Maybe... Uh, There's just too many options in the garden. Maybe we just didn't hear exactly the way we should have been hearing. So I know that before I go to the mission field, I really feel this um, a a much more of an urgent. And it's a shame because it shouldn't be like that. It should be a daily recourse or a, a, a regular lifestyle recourse. But I know that I'm going to be confronted with much more than, than I am here with the supernatural. And I want to be a vessel that's as ready as I possibly can be. And I ask for God's forgiveness, and I say, God, could you work through this? Could we get to a place where I just know that I know that I know that you're all in all in everything that I need? And so it comes a place where food doesn't taste as good or or entertainment isn't quite as as it used to be and it's just I desire something and that's what I'm saying when I say I need to tighten my straps because soon I forget that and I want to just entertain and do all those things again quickly because it's easy and it feels good but it doesn't feel good it's just a season If I had my choice, when I know now what I know when I'm ready to go and I'm soldiering up, I know that that, what that feels like. We want to be to a place where Satan has nothing on us. We want to know that who he is and we want to know who we are in him. We want to stay connected, and we don't want the cares of this world compete with all the nutrients that are meant for the word of God and for how he is playing that through us. Would you stand with me, please? The difference is to know when he puts a spotlight on something in our lives, and we then take that opportunity And for those few seconds before it takes roots, we do something about it. We do something about it. It is so simple to pull weeds right when they're just sticking up their little heads. (laughs) But you can even get them before they even put those roots in the ground. so grateful for a God that loves us so extravagantly. He doesn't want us to stay the change, to stay the same. He's looking for us to move ahead in him 
if you honestly are taking an assessment today, let's just look and see if we're so busy, if all those other weeds are there, is it any reason for us to believe that we can't hear God? Our greatest vessel we have is our prayer and our petitions that we make to him, but we lose we lose our desire to do that. Now, I'm not talking to everybody. And I'm speaking very much to myself. And I thank you for coming along into my personal space. <laughs> thank you. But I know there's some that struggle in the same areas that I do. And maybe just one or two of these things have meant a little something to you. But I just, just want to say... If your straps have gotten loose, if you find yourself coming undone because the things that you saw so tight and you would never, ever compromise and you would never go there because God gave you a truth in your heart, then this is for you today because we have opportunities and this is one that he has opened up for you. This is never anything we need to be ashamed about. Is there anyone in here that's a human being? Some are not. It's amazing. It's amazing to me. We have some robots, I guess. All right. And what we do know is that this is a house of grace. This is a house that God gives to his children. And there is freedom for us. Am I seeking the right word? There's grace here. <laughs> if you've been offered that grace and that kind of mercy from God, it brings you to the knees. It brings you to your knees. Because you really do know that you are a sinner and God has given you such a gift. So I, I'm going to ask you just right now without too much thought other than yeah, she's talking to, this is talking to me. Just come on out. Just come on out and just make your way right up here. It's a good time. It's a great morning to be right here before the Father and just say, you know, there might be too many weeds in here, and I, I just want to simplify. I just want, I just want that seed of faith, that strong, tiny seed, and I don't want to choke out all of those things. This is, this is our season to really hone in. This is your season to see that God is speaking to you. There are things that need to go. They are not of God. There are things that need to be moved away and not revisited again. Or if nothing else, there's a season Are you grateful to God? Are you grateful? So grateful. Would you just reach out your hands to him? And I just want us to all sing this together, and then we'll say a prayer. Ready? Make this a sweet prayer to him. Make this a sweet prayer. Father, we would give you this day. Just hold your hands up to him. We would give you these worries of life. Father, we would give you this deceitfulness of the wealth. Father, the things scripturally that you have said we do not. We do not entertain these things. For they could choke the word. 
Father, we would choose this day to walk so that we would have good soil to be planted into. Father, the things that have distracted us, we ask for your forgiveness. Right now, Father, forgive us for our distractions. Father, forgive us for not honing into you every day, every hour. Father, draw us to you. Draw us to you. We thank you for that amazing grace. How sweet the sound, yes, that saved a wretch like me. For you once were lost, amen, but now I am found. And you were blind, but now you can see. And Father, you have given so richly. Thank you for sorting out our priorities. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that says, no more, no more, no more in your precious holy name. Father, there's a war that's going on. There's a war. Father, and in that war of the weeds, Lord, we would spring up with the word of God. And the goodness of your hand in our lives, in your precious name. Amen, amen, amen. We invite our worship team just to come and just to lay hands and just agree with you on these matters. If they don't move quickly, they might lose it. So I'm just asking them to, to come. Now they're already praying. Maybe some other ones are free. So just stand there, just worship. Let them just agree with you this day. I release all others today. Thank you so much. Bless you. And we'll see you next week. God bless you.